Welcome to the Church of God International here in London. We are always very pleased to welcome you here. Good afternoon, everybody. A very warm welcome to the Church of God International here in the United Kingdom. Welcome to our weekly Sabbath service and, of course, welcome to the last day of Unleavened Bread. I pray, brethren, that we've given some serious reflection over the last seven stroke eight days to the meaning of the days that we have been observing. Because, brethren, they are days that are full of deep meaning full of deep meaning. Days where we have come together and we have rededicated ourselves before our Saviour and God the Father. We have remembered, just eight days ago, we remembered and observed the Passover when Christ died for us. And of course, it's probably beyond our comprehension to take it all in. To take in the magnitude of what he did for us. We know what he did for us. But the dedication and the trust in God the Father, the trust to to carry out and be obedient to the will of the Father. What a wonderful thing he did for us. We we cannot fully comprehend the the, the depth of trust and, and the sorrow he went through. Yet, brethren, we have been given the Holy Spirit. We've been given Christ's mind, the power of the Holy Spirit, God's mind within us, to know that what Jesus Christ did, it was the greatest act of love that any man has ever done on behalf of another. So we came together and we observed the Passover with humility, with a renewed sense of dedication and thankfulness, thankful that our sins have been forgiven. And then the next day, as commanded in scripture, the next day we remembered Israel leaving Egypt behind and we commemorated the night to be much observed. We read about that in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 41. And it came to pass at the end of 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Verse 42, it is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed for all the children of Israel in their generation. And that's what we did, brethren. We we observed the Passover, and then we observed the night to be much observed. And for the last seven days, we have been commemorating the Days of Unleavened Bread, which is not an Old Testament feast. It wasn't done away with. In fact, as we know in Corinthians, Paul reminds the church to purge out the old leaven. Purge out that old leaven, that you may be a new lump, For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Therefore, let us, let us now in this New Testament era, Christ has been sacrificed. Let us keep the feast. Let's carry on keeping the feast of unleavened bread. Not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So we have put out the leaven from our homes. We put out the leaven from our personal spaces. We got rid of it. We got rid of the symbolism of sin. And as Israel left Egypt behind, we have symbolically left behind sin, getting rid of the physical leaven during the days of unleavened bread. But brethren, the days of unleavened bread are coming to a close. The days of unleavened bread, bread, they're coming to a close. And I would like to ask a simple question. Now what? What do we do now? As these days come to a close, what do we do? Of course, some of us may be longing for that little bit of leavened 
that lemon treat, you know, that we've been missing, that's part of our normal diet. But in our spiritual life, brethren, we cannot afford to let our guard down. How do we carry on from this moment on? How do we carry on from this point? How do we move on as we acknowledge the count to Pentecost in the coming days? What form should our walk take? Now, in the coming weeks, I'm sure we'll touch on this next scripture on more than one occasion. So it won't be my purpose here to concentrate on this particular verse. But please turn to Second Peter chapter 1. Because this verse here, or these sections of verses, illustrate what we should be looking at within ourselves as we move from the days of unleavened bread to Pentecost and beyond. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Saviour Jesus Christ. Verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Brethren, how clear it is here, how clear is this, in relation to the days of Passover and unleavened bread. Peter here reminds us that we are a covenant people who have been called to glory. And he goes on to say, in answer to my next question of now what? He goes on to say that what comes next as we leave the, as the days of unleavened bread behind. He says in verse 5, Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, this is the faith we have now. Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Brethren, there are seven weeks in our count to Pentecost. Seven weeks. And we are instructed to add here seven godly characteristics to the faith that we already have. I ask you, brethren, to privately study on these scriptures. Privately ponder and meditate. Look at these scriptures and verses. Add to your faith the things that uh, Peter is asking us to do here. Because as we move on, also meditate on Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 where we are told to let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. We need, brethren, to, to move on, add into what we have, add into our faith, not being stuck, going nowhere. We need to be developing the mind of Christ, the one who sacrificed himself for you and I. So as is so often the case, the direction we take from here it hangs on our understanding of who we are and the depth of our relationship with Christ. So, brethren, as we move away from these days of unleavened bread, keep those scriptures in mind. The very Jesus Christ who died for you and me, who died for us, he made himself of no reputation. He, he was obedient, humble, Humble and obedient to the very point of death. And this is who we strive to emulate each and every day. And now as we understand more, as we understand more of the days that we are in, we must continue to develop the mind of Christ. Strengthen and reinforce your conviction through the power of the Holy Spirit. And in a manner of speaking, brethren, the Holy Spirit is one advantage that we have over the Israelites that left Egypt. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. As Israel was delivered from sin in the form of leaving Egypt, 
We also, as we know, through the sacrifice and acceptance of our Saviour's shed blood, we have been delivered from sin. We may be a forgiven people, but we are also a delivered people. Israel were also delivered. Yet for all they saw, for all they heard, they were soon complaining, soon yearning to go back to Egypt. In the days ahead, brethren, as we leave these days of unleavened bread, will we fall into the same trap? Will we yearn to fall back into a sinful way of life when when the going gets tough? That sinful way of life that we've left behind? Because, brethren, for, for all of the understanding we have, and these feelings of renewal, it won't be long, brethren, before the world is getting your attention again. Right now, as we speak, right now we should be on fire with spiritual adrenaline running through our veins. Just like it is sometimes at the Feast of Tabernacles. When we leave the Feast of Tabernacles, we come back with a spring in our step. But brethren, I wonder how long it will be before the adrenaline or the spiritual rush, the spiritual zeal, how long will it be before it wears off? How long will it be before the world competes for your attention again? And your carnal nature, it fights to pull you away from the righteous path. Let's say, uh, let's give it a week or so. Let's give it a week or two before your carnal nature is fighting against the spirit. Or maybe, let's say, maybe a day or two. Maybe a day or two before the world is competing for your attention. Your carnal nature is striving to pull you away. But brethren, better still, let's get real. Let's get real. There will never be a time when any of the forces that are against God will let up in pulling you away from the, from the righteous path. Let me ask you a question. Did your carnal nature take a week's holiday as we observed the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread? Or did we find ourselves dealing with our carnality every single day? And if we found ourselves dealing with our carnal nature at the time when we are focused, when we're really focused on putting the leaven and sin out of our lives during the Days of Unleavened Bread, Is that not an indicator that we must never lose focus? Because we will always be in this spiritual fight. The spiritual righteous fight, brethren, is now. It's now and it will be forever until the return of Jesus Christ. This is why we have to endure to the end. In Exodus chapter 14, turn there, Exodus chapter 14, and we'll look at verse 8. Exodus chapter 14, verse 8. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. Here again, brethren, we can learn a lesson from the Exodus story. At this point in time, Israel hadn't yet crossed the Red Sea. They were in the middle of the Days of Unleavened Bread. And Pharaoh was on their tail once more, wanting them back. He doesn't want to let them go. And so, brethren, it is with Satan. His jealousy, his hatred, his pride. It means he will never stop hunting you. Do do you understand that? Satan will never stop hunting you. As I say, we, we may be called the Church of the Forgiven. We may be called the church of the delivered, but we are also the church of the hunted. The world will never let up with its distractions, distractions that range from your own sinful nature, those ones that you battle against, that sin that so easily ensnares you. The world will never let up with its distractions and there will be trials that come from just living in this world. Trials that may come even with hindsight, through unwise decisions. 
How many of us have made unwise decisions? Answer, all of us. We've all made unwise decisions. Let us learn from scripture, brethren, because God has He's invited you and I. He's called you and I out of this world. Yet the God who has called us, the God who has delivered you, and the God who will allow you to experience trials has not called you to fail. And that is one thing we need to always keep in the forefront of our minds. So for today's message, brethren, I would like to reflect on who we are. As we move away from these days of unleavened bread, understand who we are. Understand the journey we have been called to. And understand how we're going to get there. How we're going to reach the destination of a promised land. And I'd like to look at it from the viewpoint of us, again, leaving the days of unleavened bread behind and moving on in our walk of deliverance. Because, brethren, we will face trials on our walk. We will for the pull of our sinful nature. Sinful nature that comes upon us when the going gets tough and, and that carnality is pulling you away. And this can come in any form. And on our journey, we may feel like giving up. If it can happen to Israel, who saw clearly the power of God, then it can happen to anyone. So as we strive, brethren, to develop the mind of Christ, as we seek to follow him in our walk, I have good news. Because in the midst of trial and tribulation, on the walk to where we are going, if we seek him, if we seek first the kingdom of God, if we follow Jesus Christ, God will provide. God will provide. So let us look then, let us look at who we claim to be. Who are we? Turn with me to Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. Who does scripture say we are? Those of us who now have God's Holy Spirit and have accepted the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Who are we? Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptised into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond or free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Heirs according to the promise, brethren. This is who we are. We are children who are heirs to the promise. Abraham's seed and Christ's. So brethren, if we are Christ's and spiritually Abraham's seed, what is this promise that we are heirs to? Because whatever Abraham was promised, the same promise applies to us. Let's look at Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show you. Verse 7. And the Lord appeared unto Abram, and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there built he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. Brethren, there is a promise. There is a promise of being being given a particular land. And it's a land that are given to those who belong to Christ. And as we leave the days of unleavened bread, let us never forget at all times we are people of the covenant. We are a covenant people. It is the same covenant that Abraham, Isaac and Jacob were bound by. The same covenant that goes back to the obedience of and the faith of Abraham. Yet Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and all the other men and women of faith, all the other people of the covenant, they haven't yet fully inherited the land. 
In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So today, in our 21st century, those of us who have been called out of the world, brethren, we too are strangers and we are pilgrims. But the covenant promises are still in place. Yet by the grace of God and the shed blood of our Saviour, we are a people who have been grafted into Israel. That's who we are as well. We are a people grafted into Israel and therefore we are bound by its terms and conditions. We have been called out, we have been separated, and we are on a journey, the same journey as all who went before us, the same journey that has an eternal promise and is in a covenant that cannot be broken. So let's look back, let's go and have a quick look. As we leave these days of unleavened bread, let us look at some of the history of Israel that led them, let them be delivered. Because their deliverance is an example for all whom God will call through the ages. In Exodus chapter 2 and verse 23, we read, And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up to God by reason of the bondage. So here we see the children of Israel under oppression. Here we see a covenant people, brethren, a covenant people under oppression. At this point, they had been in Egypt over 400 years and they were strangers in a foreign land. And they were strangers with a weakness, just like you and I. We have weaknesses in this land that we're in now. But Israel always had a weakness. They were a people and they are a people who just cannot help themselves to do what they wanted. They, like us, they also had a sin that so easily ensnared them. It was their spiritual Achilles heel, if you like. Because despite the covenant promises, despite the teachings from the patriarchs, Israel always drifted away from God. And so it was no, no different in Egypt. As far back as Genesis, we see the covenant people, we see Israel being warned about going after foreign gods, going after strange gods. Genesis 35 verse 2 says, Then Jacob said unto his household and to all who were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. So mix in with the Egyptians, brethren. So mix in with the Egyptians for hundreds of years. Marrying those who would lead them astray, it had its consequences. It got to the point where the oppression was so bad, they cried out to God. Now we know that the law of God was given way before Sinai. So obviously Israel must have known that they should have no other gods before the true God. But that's, his, that's, uh, that's Israel. That is who they were. Their history is littered with idolatry. And they, because of the covenant clauses, they reaped what they sowed. So let us read again Exodus chapter 2, 23. We just read it, but we're now reading it from the English Standard Version. And it enlightens us just a little bit more here to their condition. During those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned. They groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. Now in the Hebrew, this scripture here is a bit more profound. The Hebrew says, they cried unto the God. Israel cried unto the God. If they cried out to the God, it implies they must have had a remembrance of him. There must be something going on somewhere in the back of their minds that there was the God, the one and only true God that they should be worshipping. 
So they, they had a remembrance, but they did not have a lifestyle of obedience to him. They were also aware that they were a special people. So what is God's response to their cry? Verse 24, God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. So we know the rest of the story. We are aware that God, in line with his covenant, in line with his promises, delivered the Israelites and freed them from the Egyptians and freed them from their oppression. He led and delivered them. The example and comparison for us, as we all know, is very clear. God provided. And for us, brethren, also, God will provide. Egypt was likened to sin. And the people were oppressed by it. And the people, the Israelites, were delivered from it. We, through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we have been called out of oppression. We have been called out of the slavery of this world. We have been called to receive forgiveness. We have been called to receive deliverance. Deliverance from the wages of sin, which is eternal death. That's who we are, brethren. We are a called out people. And in obedience to the covenants and the laws of God, these past few days, we have dutifully observed the Passover and the days of unleavened bread. But brethren, do we not still have much to learn? You know, many of us who have just observed the Passover and the days of unleavened bread, we've been doing it for years. In some cases, decades. Just, just sit and ponder now. Think for yourselves. Reflect here. How have these days that we've just observed, how have they impacted upon you personally? Is it something that we, we just do because we've done it for years? Is it becoming a bit, you know, a bit of a ritual, a bit ritualistic? Or are we learning more? Are we blasé about keeping these days? I mean, feeling, having that understanding of, uh, well, we know it's in the Bible, so uh, we, we, we do it. And if the answer is, upon reflection, you know, yes, I am a bit slack. I didn't prepare quite as I should. Then woe, brethren, woe, woe, woe. Is such an attitude pleasing to God? Because it's a slippery slope. It's a slippery slope that will lead us to the same fate as Israel. Don't start on the road that leads you away from Christ. We cannot be like Israel who called upon God in desperation. Prior to that, they just rejected him. Dwell on the importance of the days, brethren. Dwell on them knowing that we are a called out people. Are we humble that we've been given, uh, forgiven from our sins? I believe, brethren, that I can confidently speak for all of God's people to say that now, in, in this moment, upon reflection, we do feel humbled. We do feel renewed. We have a sense of purpose. We have renewed our dedication. I know that today we are joyful. We've been able to rededicate ourselves. And now surely we appreciate that more than ever. We've been delivered from sin. But the human condition, the human condition, brethren, is we're flesh and blood. And that's something we cannot change. We cannot change the physicality of who we are. And so it is, brethren. And so it is that certain things go with the territory. Certain things go with us being flesh and blood. Because even though we have been called out of the world, we've been separated, consecrated, we are still subject to the potholes in the road. We shall in this life always be subject to the pull of the flesh. And it must not be overlooked. Don't you agree that even when faced with the obvious course of action, the right way as opposed to the wrong way, even when it's as clear as day. Don't you agree? The struggle still remains. The struggle always remains. 
Our carnality never fully leaves us. So let's ask a question. After Israel were delivered, did they leave Egypt? Did Israel leave Egypt? Physically, yes, they did. But in their hearts and minds, did Israel leave Egypt? I don't think they did. Israel just kept on complaining. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 10, we read, When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in this wilderness? What have you done? Moses was following orders. Moses was working on behalf of Jesus Christ and God the Father. What have you done, they said, in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we have said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. Now hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. These are the same people that cried out to the God. Now they want to go back and serve people that worshipped idols. It never leaves them, brethren. Is this, this, I, this sense of wanting to serve other gods? The easy way out, easy street. It never leaves them. And then they said, For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. What is happening? What is happening with these people? And this is one of numerous complaints. We haven't got time to go through them, but we know Israel always complains. They never, in their hearts, they never left Egypt. There wasn't any faith. They never had any trust, even after all they had seen. How God sent the plagues on Egypt, how he spared them. No thought to the fact that they were set apart. There was no thought to the fact how he ultimately led them by the pillar of cloud and pillar of fire. No thought to the fact that they cried out and God provided and he will continue to do so. There was never any thought of this because through the pull of the flesh, They'd never left Egypt. They still complained. And so, brethren, therein lies the challenge for us as we move away from the days of unleavened bread, the days where we purged out the sin. The last few days, brethren, sin has been in focus. And the challenge, the challenge is to remain in that unleavened state. And it is a challenge, isn't it? Think of the story of Lot. There's another example. Lot and his wife. Another example of what not to do as we move away from these days of unleavened bread. And actually it's a case in point for being doers of the law and making right choices. Being a doer. Making the effort to develop the mind of Christ. Doing something about it. Now we all know the we all know the story of Lot and his wife. Lot, the nephew of Abraham, living in a place called Sodom, a filthy, perverted land, a wicked place. Yet for all of that, Lot decided to live among it. And it had consequences, brethren. Lot put himself through trying times. In 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 8, we read, For as that righteous man, that's referring to Lot, For as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. 
I'd like you to notice here, brethren, that Lot is labelled as a righteous man. He is a righteous man. That is one who keeps the commands of God. Yet this righteous man tormented himself. He tormented himself by the actions of the filth that he both saw and heard. Not only that, brethren, he, tor he, um, he exposed his own family to such filth. There was something holding Lot back from, from upping sticks and getting out of there. Something was holding him back from moving on. It was only when God decided to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah that Lot was rescued, that Lot was delivered. Yet, as we know, it wasn't the same for his wife, was it? Because she disobeyed. Lot's wife disobeyed the command to not look back. She paid with her life. She paid with her life just to look because she looked back. Why did she look back? Why did she look back? Only she knows that. Consider her environment, her environment though, which she looked back to. An environment that, uh, politely put, was an environment of sin. She was surrounded by it. She put up with it. And if she wasn't in agreement with it, she tolerated it. And thus it is not unreasonable to say she became less resistant to it. And also the effects of it. Her life was wrapped up in and among it and it was this life that she had to leave behind and she had to uproot herself and this can be painful because no doubt she spent many years there and that's an example for us brothers isn't it we must not look back to where we've come from because the world is filthy of course there are many decent people but the world is filthy we're surrounded by filth Upon baptism, brethren, we left that behind. We've just rededicated ourselves. We can't yearn to go back to it when things may get a bit tough. For us going forward, let us be assured of our calling. Let us be assured of where our calling will lead us. Let us not reason away in our carnal minds excuses as to why we, why we may still dabble with the world and its ways. We've got to leave it behind, brethren. We've got to leave it. We can't have one foot in both camps. So as we move away from these days of unleavened bread, we'll also do well to remember Lot's wife. In Luke chapter 9, verse 62, Jesus said, No one who puts his hand to the plough and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Brethren, we cannot afford to look back if we want to make it into the kingdom. Which leads me to my next point. Our journey. The journey we have been called to. It's a promised land. We saw earlier, earlier in the message, we, that we are indeed spiritual Israelites. And as such, we are duty bound to obey the terms of the covenant. We keep the commandments. We keep the holy days. We live in obedience to God's law. We are heirs to the same promises given to Abraham and his descendants. That's a promised land. But as we saw, Abraham, along with Isaac and Jacob, they didn't receive the promises. Neither did the very individuals whom God delivered from Egypt. They disobeyed. They paid the price through captivity. Yet we know that God is a God who does not lie. It's impossible for him to lie. So it can only mean that this promise is one that is yet to be fulfilled. So as we move on to Pentecost, as we move away from the days of unleavened bread, and as we learn from the history of a covenant people who never stop complaining, let us look at this journey that we are on. So what is this journey? Well, it is the same journey that Israel failed to complete. 
It is a journey to the promised land. And it is a journey that will result in the ultimate deliverance of the covenant people. And the resurrection of the saints. And this will occur at the return to the promised land by Jesus Christ himself, our Passover lamb. Prior to uh, Jesus Christ's return, we know that the world will be in turmoil. The nation of Israel and her people who are, who are still at this point far removed from, from God, the people of Israel prior to Christ's return will be under siege. Through their disobedience, God allows them, God allows the ones he loves, the covenant people, he will allow them to be brought to the very brink of destruction. Yet he has a covenant with them. He is, as scripture says, the Holy One of Israel. And as he fought for them in delivering them from Egypt, he returns to deliver and fight for them again. Fight, fighting for them, showing that once more, showing them once more, that God will provide. In Zechariah chapter 14, verse 3, we read, Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. Matthew 24, verse 22, And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, that is, that for the sake of the Israelites, those with the DNA of Israel, and of those who are grafted into Israel, those days will be cut short. Brethren, we serve a wonderful and merciful God. A God who chose a people, who delivered a people, and was rejected by the same people. But you know, in, in a strange way, it's to our benefit, the Gentiles' benefit, that Israel failed. Because by their actions, salvation was made possible for everyone by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Romans 11 verse 11, Paul writes, Have they, that is Israel, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. You know, Israel, they're going to be seriously annoyed when they come to their senses, when they actually wake up to see what they have forsaken. They will be driven to repentance in more ways than one. And upon true repentance, God will remember his covenant with them. And we should take it upon ourselves to learn from that. This kingdom of God the promised land that we are waiting to enter is metaphorically speaking at the end of a hard road, brethren. But brethren, it is a road that we have accepted to walk on. We've accepted this invitation to come out of the world. But it's a road that asks a question that before you take another step on this road, have you counted the cost? Have you truly counted the cost of this road that you're about to walk on? Because there will be many hurdles along the way. Christ warned his disciples, who now in this day and age, let us consider ourselves disciples of Jesus Christ. Matthew 10, 22, You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Have you counted that cost? That some of us may be hated, or certainly some of us will be hated, because of the name of Jesus Christ, the one we say that we are now following? In Acts 14 verse 22, we read, Through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Through many tribulations, brethren, we must enter the promised land. There's no easy way. Have we counted the cost? Are we still counting the cost? 
So don't lose heart, brethren, when the trials come. They have to come. Why? Because we have left Pharaoh and Egypt. We have left Satan and sin behind. We have been freed from the oppression and the world hates us. So we cannot afford to be like Israel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, we read, Neither murmur as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Therefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. There it is, brethren, examples for us. As we wander through an increasingly godless society, as we wander through a spiritual wilderness, we must look seriously at Israel. We have all been warned as to what lies ahead. Consider that the same wrath that saved the Israelites, the same godly anger that delivered them, also destroyed them as they got mixed up with the world and its murmurings. Let it not be so among us, brethren. So as we come to a close, let us see from Scripture how, if we trust in the Father, how we too will inherit the promised land of the kingdom of God. Because as I said earlier, God will provide. Following on from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 and 13, or verse 13, we read, there has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. To bear it. There it is, brethren, a way of escape, deliverance. Notice the phrase, common to man. Simply put, it means everyone, called or not, every man and woman, mankind, everyone who is of the flesh would experience the pitfalls of life. But those without God, those who don't understand God, don't have God's Holy Spirit, they have nothing but human know-how. They don't have any way. They have no hope. We, on the other hand, have expectations. And we have Jesus Christ, who will provide a way of escape. Jesus Christ, brethren, he will part your Red Sea. He is the way, the truth and the life. And that is how we get into the kingdom of God. By following him. He is the perfect example. The ultimate example who shed his blood for us. In John 10 verse 9, Jesus says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Acts 4 verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ, brethren, is the way. He is the only way. He overcame the world for us. What more do we want? What more do we want? The ground has been trod. As Moses said in Exodus 14 verse 13, Fear not, stand firm. And that's the message to us, brethren, and all the disciples through the years. Fear not, stand firm, be unshakable, be unmovable, be convicted. That the God we serve will deliver you. The God we serve will deliver you. And he will deliver us unto the kingdom of God. But it will all be done according to his will. Because remain steadfast in the knowledge of the covenant promise. Because God's deliverance for us may not be quite our definition. Of deliverance because our deliverance from trial may not come in this lifetime his will may be that some of us will sleep 
before he arrives. Yet when he arrives, our eternal deliverance into the promised land, into the kingdom of God, will be at the resurrection. There are countless examples, brethren, of God providing for his people. Perhaps the most vivid example of trusting in God, perhaps it will take us back to the beginning and the example of Abraham. As Isaac asked, you know, where is the lamb? Where, where is the lamb, father, that we're going to, to slaughter? Abraham's response was, God will provide. God will provide. God did provide. God did provide. Another example of God providing a way of escape for Israel through the, through the Red Sea. Consider he has provided us with the Holy Spirit. He's provided us with the potential to, to uh, develop his character. The potential to bring every thought into captivity rather than us being held captive of sin. And consider that he has provided us with the church, the ecclesia, the called out. He has provided us with the spiritual body of Christ. Do not neglect that, brethren. Do not undervalue your fellow members. I urge you all, develop the gift that God has placed within you and use it for the edification of the body that God has provided. So, brethren, as we move away from the days of unleavened bread, and as we seek to, to uh, develop the mind of Christ on our journey to the promised land of the kingdom of God, meditate again on 2 Peter chapter 1 and verses 5 to 7. Read that in your own time. And take it on board. And in relation to our walk in this wilderness of sin and this godless society, and when, when we're having our struggles, when you, have, when you struggle with your patience, when you're struggling to raise your game and to act kindly to one who has offended you, or you may struggle to keep your emotions in check, remember who you are and where you, where you have been called to. Follow Jesus Christ. Follow the path. Stick to the path that you're on. Seek first the promised land. Seek first the kingdom of God. And in doing so, God will provide. May God bless you all, brethren, as we move on now through the Feast of Weeks. Amen.